Hello. Welcome. I guess that means we're rolling. So um, this presentation is titled uh, DEFCON 3, OpenStack Meets the Information and Security Department. Um, how's that mic working? Everyone hear me? Great. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is basically uh, recurring themes or problems that we have encountered when deploying OpenStack into enterprises. And these are issues that, um, that you know, they may be familiar to you, they, they may be new, but they're not necessarily going to be issues that arise in a model greenfield implementation. So these are issues that, are, that arise in, in um, real OpenStack deployments where you have a legacy information security department. Okay, so before I go on, I'll just give a little bit of context so you know where I'm coming from. I work for Solinia. Um, Solinia is a, is a company, we have three areas of business. Uh, we have firstly consulting services, and consulting we try to help customers accelerate their adoption of, of open infrastructure and primarily OpenStack. So within consulting, we have four main um, phases that we work through. They are conceive, architect, uh, integrate, and adopt. So the issues that I'm going to talk about come mostly from the, the architecture and integration sides. But those steps, conceiving is basically building a cloud strategy, um, working out a roadmap for implementation, understanding the, the use cases that the customer has. Architecting is then taking that information and building an architecture for the, for the client. Integration is actually building it, um, deploying, integrating with any external systems that they have. And then adoption is helping that customer use the cloud, which moves into the next area, which is training. So we offer training services to our customers. And in, in that area, we train on OpenStack operations, uh, architecture, also open source software such as um, Docker and, and, and other, um, other components essential to the cloud ecosystem. And then lastly, but not least, we have Goldstone, which is a product that has come from our experiences in actually deploying OpenStack for customers. And this product is basically, it's a platform to help customers operate OpenStack. It's a, you know, metrics, compliance, et cetera. And um, I'll introduce myself. I'm, my name's James Clark, and I work in the Seoul office. So Selenia has headquartered in um, San Francisco, and we have two Asia Pacific offices in Tokyo and Seoul. Um, my customer area mainly is Asia and Europe, so if any of the things that I talk about here seem a little foreign, that may be the reason why. Just, to, just before I move on, um, I see there's quite a few people here. Can I get some idea of uh, what you're involved in? So how many people here are actually involved in um, delivering or deploying OpenStack to outside clients. Okay, and how many are involved in deploying within your own organization? Excellent. Great. Okay, so the topics I'm going to work through today, um, first of all, I'm going to talk about network security. The reason I tackle that first is network security is one of the things that really shapes the architecture of the cloud. So if that is actually not handled well, um, the cloud is never going to be able to be deployed properly. Then I'm going to move on to talk about the control plane. And by that, I mean the OpenStack controllers themselves. So you know, your, your three-node HA controller cluster typically, or, or however the, the vendor um, deployment of OpenStack is structured. Then I'll talk a little bit about identity. So that is the, um, the keystone side of things, how that integrates in with the organization. Uh, next, I'll talk about IPAM. Uh, then, as a special exception, I'm going to talk about CICD. Uh, CICD because the way you architect the cloud and CICD needs to be tightly integrated. Um, if that's not done well, you'll, they'll, they'll never work together properly after, the, after they're deployed. And then lastly, I'm going to talk a little bit about compliance. So some of the issues that we find with maintaining the customer's legacy compliance um, requirements. So 
so we're, we're a little short of time, so I'm going to try and work through this quickly. Um, the things I'm going to focus on are based on the OpenStack reference implementation, and by that I mean not with any additional special source or, or vendor products. And the reason I'm going to focus on, on that is so that to keep the maximum relevance. So some of the things there may be other solutions for, but I'm going to stick on the reference implementation so you can then make your own judgment whether or not you can fix it yourself or you, you know, obtain a, a, an external product to do that. Um, I'm going to be talking about implementation issues for the, the, the OpenStack itself, so not so much about migration of apps onto open, OpenStack, but actually you know, deploying OpenStack. As I mentioned before, there will be a little bit of CICD talk in there just because it's, it's very critical to the architecture. And these are, again, actual implementations. So they're not like reference model implementations where we get to do everything exactly the way we want. These are implementations where you know, things are imperfect and we have to sort of bend things to, to make them fit. I'm not going to talk about the actual platform security itself. Um, there's some really good content on the OpenStack website for things like how to secure the, the controllers themselves and you know, best practices for all those things. I'm also not going to talk about formal compliance, so PCI or, or other particular targets. Um, again, there's plenty of res resource material on that that, is, that has been around for some time. And as I mentioned, no application security design talk. So I'd just like to introduce the, the information security team here. Um, when we start out deploying, uh, we need to look at the, the, how the high-level shape of the cloud is going to look. And the, the two key um, uh, people that we need to talk to, or when I say people, that could be a department, are the, the CISO themselves and also the, the risk assessment team. And risk assessment is also sometimes known as uh, information security. And what they do is they look at threats, the value of the information that's going into the system, um, what the possible attack vectors are, and what the mitigations that you have in there. And then they work out whether or not that actually meets their policy guidelines for, um, for implementation. Later on, when we come to implementation, we need to talk to security engineering, access management, security operations, and um, the, the CERT team. And I'll just briefly mention here why I call this, um, I title this DEFCON 3, is often, oftentimes when you're dealing with the information security department and you're trying to roll out a cloud, they view that as a as they should, um, as a threat. It's a potential threat to the information security. So they, the atmosphere can be a little defensive, so there'll be a lot of justification of why things are the way they are, um, and, and that's where that, um, that title comes from. It's not entirely always the case, but uh, it, it often can be. Excuse me. Okay, network security. So one of the first things that you'll often encounter when you walk into a, a large organization is that their security model is largely based on the concept of perimeters. So you'll be familiar with this. This is the, um, the firewall model. It's a, very, um, it's a very blunt instrument for enforcing security. Um, there will be a lot of manual controls there. So to get firewall rules opened, you need to actually go through a policy check and someone will actually evaluate that and determine if it's sufficient for the, the risk or the, the information involved and, and then implement those, those rules. Um, these things have usually been in place for a long time, maybe even a decade, and what you'll find is that a lot of the internal people have developed their own workarounds for this security model. So they may have things like SSH tunnels or VPNs punch through holes in the firewall that they're using to get their job done. But um, as an outside um, consultant, you can't actually use those. You have to build a clean architecture that the information security team will sign off on. So often our task is a little, is a little more difficult than it is for um, you know, the, the teams that you're actually working with inside the company, the, the company's uh, infrastructure team, for example. Um, one of the other complicating aspects you, you might run into is that the, the information security department may actually recognize that there are all of these tunnels, their, their firewalls are, are quite um, holy, and they want to actually raise the bar. So they're going to try and actually use the cloud to, to tighten up the security, which, which, makes, 
which makes our job a whole lot harder. When we look inside the firewall, though, we find something completely different. Uh, often, oftentimes, the subnets are, are completely open, so where applications are deployed, there's no host-based firewalls, for example. Um, the company may run uh, network intrusion detection systems. They may also use vulnerability scanners to actually prove that the, the software or the applications they're deploying are secure. And that, you can see then, is an obvious conflict with the concept of security groups. Um, security groups are a much finer-grained, uh, more targeted security model, and they're, they're actually much better. So you will end up having a discussion about whether or not um, you can do security groups, and they will have to forego the use of their vulnerability scanners, or you disable security groups so that they can actually try and make things more secure, which, which you know, sometimes seems counterintuitive. And then to ratchet the complexity up uh, another notch. This is um, quite often what, what we find inside of customers. So just to take a step back, the customers that I'm talking about here range from telecommunications, so telco service providers, uh, but not their service provider business, which is you know, facing the internet, but internal use for, say, migrating their, their legacy data centers onto, onto cloud. Um, they could be in uh, manufacturing, or another example is financial services, where a lot of these, um, these problems come up. So what they've done is they, they often will take the concept of the perimeters and then shrink them down into smaller units within inside the organization, and this helps them simplify firewall rules. But the problem that we have is where are we going to put OpenStack? Um, where are the controllers going to sit? Where are the hypervisors going to sit? And how can this actually be used? Now, if you have, um, this depends a lot on the scope of the OpenStack project that you're involved in. If you're just using OpenStack to handle a single application or a, a very single uh, specific use case, or if all of the applications you're concerned about are related and can be lumped together, you may not have a problem. But on the other hand, um, if you need to have developer access and developers are not really part of, you know, or they don't have access to the production zone, um, you can have a lot of problems. Uh, you may think that, um, you know, developers having ac access to production is not a good thing. That, that may well be the case, but the, the, if you look at the converse, if we put the cloud into the development zone and another one in production, we may not gain the benefits of being able to run a, a CI/CD tool chain to actually do deployment. We may find that um, the developer tools, what comes out of the, the developer zone because it's untrusted, still needs to go through a whole lot of legacy testing before it can go into production. So if the, if the customer is looking for agility, they may not get it. And one more step up the, the, um, the problematic uh, side of things is the fact that the, the OpenStack controllers are multi-homed. And oftentimes, customers will, you know, to simplify things, choose a provider VLAN type deployment. You know, if they're very conservative, they won't want to go for SDN. So provider VLANs using their existing firewall and um, router infrastructure is quite common. And when you do that, one of the things they will notice is, why do we have to have this trunk from all of our hypervisors flowing back into the controllers? That's a problem because we have rules which say um, you cannot mix security zones or you cannot, um, you know, if, you put, if your controller is in a particular zone, you, you cannot actually have all these, these, um, these network trunks flowing back to it. And you may be familiar with this. This is to provide things like DHCP and metadata services to virtual machines. So one solution is obviously to dis disable those, but then that breaks all of your uh, orchestration functionality. So another big problem. Okay, so moving on to some of the, the uh, solutions that we have actually run to in, in this side of things. For the control plane isolation, um, particularly where the, the customer requires physical separation, say they may have a, a trading platform that its networks cannot exist on the same hard, hardware even or switches even as, as, as other um, 
as other software, we actually have to have separate installations of the cloud software. And one particular customer that, that comes to mind um, when we were designing this, we, we got to about 11 and then thought, well, hang on, this is not, not really going to work because we can't have the solution to every problem being just add another cloud that, that's not actually going to scale. And, and operationally, it's going to be um, worse off than, than when we started. But to some degree, um, multiple clouds may be required. Another problem that we often run into is the, the firewall automation. So customers will often have the you know, very large firewalls that they use to divide everything up into their security zones, and they don't want to let go of their procedure for implementing changes to their firewalls. That may be due to regulatory requirements. They may need to have a paper trail of all of the changes and justifications. So having um, OpenStack reach out and modify those firewalls is, is also not an option. Um, this is very difficult to change. So typically the solution we go for here is that we would um, negotiate with the security team to agree on uh, a set of application classifications. So we would survey the organization's application catalog divide them up into ones which have very similar architectures and have very similar connectivity requirements, and then agree on a set of firewall rules which can be used for each application classification. And then we can preload certain subnets with those rules um, you know, before deployment. And then when end users come along and they want to deploy a new application, you know, that they, the orchestration system will know where that We'll know where that needs to go, and we'll um, you know, deploy the application that VLAN access will be on a sort of a subnet wildcard. So um, as soon as the VM's deployed, uh, it, it's up and working. So instead of a 30 or 60 day wait, they can have a VM in, in a few minutes. So to wrap up on um, perimeters, the, the basic lessons here is that the, the perimeters have a very strong uh, influence on the overall shape of your cloud. Uh, it's very important to engage extremely early to work out what these obstacles may be before you start on your, your architecture. Also, a lot of questions will be raised about governance. Um, the reason for that is when the risk assessment team is looking at your cloud, they're going to want to know that necessary controls um, the necessary operational controls are in place to make sure that everything that happens in the cloud is done according to a, a set of agreed uh, governing principles. Also be aware that the, um, the perimeter security model is going to have a lot of influences on the way you design that cannot be solved with the, the OpenStack role-based access control um, entirely. So you're going to have to do some engineering outside of that to, to handle the organization's security requirements. And also, finally, changing the security policy is, is almost always um, impossible, in, in my experience anyway. Um, a lot of these things are based on some regulatory requirements. So to get a, a security policy change is something that could take you know, a year or two. OK, moving to control plane. Um, just to briefly explain this, so one of the things I mentioned before is this needing to have you know, 10, 11 clouds to satisfy this, the network separation requirements. So you can often reach a trade-off there by implementing very tight controls on the control plane. So some of the measures here um, I've illustrated are uh, two-factor, so that Users, every user who actually needs to access the control plane um, needs to go through a two-factor identification service. That actually gives the level of um, audit logging that is, that is needed for their um, regulatory requirement. Also, API access for things like your, your CI, CD tool chain will need to run through a, a WAF, which is going to restrict access or restrict the policy beyond what, what the OpenStack RBAC can do. Uh, also, you're going to want to have um, some privileged access management there. So for the system operators who are actually going to be managing the cloud, so if they ever need to 
for example, SSH into the platform, they're going to need, um, often for regulatory requirements <coughs> again, video screen recording, basically, of all the actions that they're doing. Um, this is so that this can be used later if, um, if there is an event that needs uh, um, investigation. So the lesson here is basically that also you need to incorporate this in your design very early. Um, you also need to consider the entire tool, tool chain. Things like uh, Jenkins or um, Packer that are going to be building VMs on the cloud um, and they need API access, they're going to need very special handling because that's not going to work through uh, any kind of two-factor system so that you'll need a, an alternative solution for managing the the, um, or for mitigating that, that security risk. Okay, and, excuse me. Okay, identity. Um, this one is not too, usually too much of a problem area. One of the things that you will always notice is that the enterprises will never use the Keystone internal SQL database, they will always want to have their identity team look after the access, and the identity team will want to use their existing uh, either LDAP or Active Directory system. Um, a problem, though, arises in that security recognize that this is actually a, a legacy configuration, and they do not like the fact that you have plain text passwords exposed outside of their the control of their um, AD environment. So, for example, if you if you bind OpenStack to a to an AD server or LDAP server, people still send their plain text password. Or it'll be an SSL, but when it gets to Keystone, it gets unwrapped. So, if anyone has actually compromised the OpenStack uh, box, they can potentially sniff all of these um, these passwords, which security people don't like at all. Um, another thing is at least with Keystone v2, when you integrate with LDAP, you have to have all of your service users, so your Nova, Cinder, Glance, uh, et cetera, they all need to be stored in plain text in the file system, and that's another no-no from a security perspective. An additional thing that, that I mentioned earlier that they want is, is two-factor. Um, that is, in, in my experience, is often implemented through uh, a VDI solution. So there'll be something like a, a Citrix or VMware View environment that users have to jump through a, a hoop with an authenticator and a, and a pin to access. And then that, from that environment, they can then access the cloud. Now, you can see there's a problem there if you want to run um, an API through that, because that's, that's, that's not going to survive all of those hops. So moving on to the solutions here, uh, with, with the plain text passwords, what we can do with now with Keystone v3 is we can use the domain configuration. So we can separate the service users into, um, into their own local domain so they can reside in the Keystone database. And then we can have all of the user domains um, using the, the AD system. And that, that, makes, um, that makes security much, much happier. Um, for two-factor, though, it gets a little more complicated if we don't want to use the VDI solution. Um, but what we can do is we can use federation uh, and single sign-on. So many of these enterprises are now also recognizing that you know, this LDAP model is not as secure as they would like. So they are starting to run their own uh, identity providers. Um, the cases that we've encountered have been uh, OpenAM, um, SAML, I should say. SAML uh, with a um, uh, LDAP backend, so they can retain their their existing directory store and front end it with um, with OpenAM. Uh, in this in these particular instances, the credentials never pass through OpenStack, so the users are redirected to the some single sign-on portal and then back to the dashboard or other tools that you might have in in the cloud environment. It's a little more complicated for API operations, but they can also be made to work. Um, in this manner. So IPAM. Uh, IPAM is often an issue because with OpenStack, we like to have the ability to just deploy a VM. Um, Neutron can grab an IP address from its pool, assign it, and then DHCP it, and everything works OK. But from the enterprise perspective, 
particularly for regulatory requirements, they may have uh, a CMDB or IPM system that needs to be capturing particular details for every IP address that's on the network. And when you think about the perimeter security model with the, the open subnets, this makes a lot of sense because when, when things are open like that, um, you know, the, you've got to have the controls on both sides to make sure that everything plays well together. So, for example, you know, they may need to have some security classification for the, the data that's behind that IP address, um, the application, the owner, um, who's going to operate that, etc. So when you're setting up OpenStack, this is not an issue, but obviously for the operation of the stack, for the deployment of VMs, this needs to be resolved. So I mentioned earlier we're talking about Juno and, and prior deployments. So the, the only solution there is to actually have uh, an external orchestration platform uh, update your IPAM database uh, out of band. So you can negotiate to have a pre-allocated subnet done manually uh, and added into the Neutron uh, IP pools ahead of time. That would be done by, by an operator. And then have your orchestration platform so that whenever you deploy a virtual machine, it'll extract the IP address and then update the, the IPAM database with all of those necessary details. In, um, I think it was Liberty or uh, maybe Mitaka and beyond, there is a pluggable IPAM API. Uh, this, is, this is very new and I'm not aware of any, any implement, in, implementations which integrate with external products, but with this model, um, this would be the way to go moving forward. So you can have OpenStack request IP addresses through a driver to your uh, existing IPAM platform. So moving on to CI and CD, now this is another real problem area. This is a very much the same problem that you have with the security zones at the start. Um, you have all of these different components which needs to talk to the cloud. You may have you know, your CI orchestration, image build, you've got maybe Packer building images for Glance. Um, these all need API access, but where are you gonna put them such that they can talk to the cloud with all the controls that you've actually put in there? So what we have found um, as, a, as a workable solution is to actually build a, an API proxy. Now that could be implemented with a commercial um, WAF product, web application firewall, or with something like Apache and mod security, and then you can construct a, a, a JSON um, filtering approach to restricting the operations that can be done from your lower level of authentication environment. So here in this diagram, for example, we have this, some two-factor users which are potentially coming from a VDI environment, so they're all safe. Um, and on the top there, the top right, we have simple authenticated clients. Now this could be your, your tool chain components. They need to run through a separate access point to, to reach the, um, the API endpoints. And that access point is going to use a, a mod security rule, which is going to verify that against some, uh, some integration point with their, um, their IAM platform. So it'll look at what groups or what operations that they're allowed to do, and then either you know, reject things that, that, that they shouldn't be doing um, and let the, the good operations through. So um, it's a little complicated, but it, 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 doesn't, it does actually work. We're running out of time. I'll quickly talk compliance. So one of the other big issues that we have with cloud is that these companies, which previously had a, like a 30 or 40 day process for starting up a VM, which you can see there on the left, part of the output of that is a paper trail of all of the compliance checks and authorizations that were needed to get that VM deployed. So when you want to just make it so that someone can, um, through an API, request a VM or uh, even just you know, through the, the web interface, have that in a few minutes, um, there's a problem. So what we need to do is we need to build the equivalent audit controls uh, into the environment so that the security team have all of the, the 
the logging and approval records that they need to actually prove that things were done well. So we change the model when we're doing CI, CD such that we codify the process, so we need to work through um, uh, refactoring the business, the business operations across all of their different teams, uh, turning that into automation code, and then changing their approvals instead into reviews of the operations for the CI platform, and then having the output of that um, be virtual machine images or packages, which can then go into a, a secure repository. On the OpenStack side, we need to integrate with usually with the, the uh, SEM platform. So we get all of the audit events from each of the OpenStack services. The way we do that is we need to enable the, the WSGI um, audit middleware. That will ensure that uh, all of the operations are output in um, CATF format, so they have who was doing the operation, where they were coming from, what the, act, the object is that they were operating on in quite a detailed format that you will not get in the normal OpenStack logs. You then need to aggregate that together and store it in a, in a secure data store. Um, you can build that itself. There are products around which um, to some degree help you do that. Uh, one of them that, um, that we've actually been working on is Goldstone, and we have a, a feature in that which is Open Trail Auditor. If you're familiar with EC2's um, Cloud Trails, this is a very similar thing. It enables you to capture all of that logging information and then push it to a protected, um, you know, read-only system which is outside the domain of control of the cloud. Well, we're almost out of time. So, quickly recapping lessons learned. Uh, firstly, it's very difficult. Um, it's, it's hard to, to deploy into these organizations that have a very old um, and very rigid security environment. Uh, and it's also very difficult to retrospectively fix your design. So it's very important then to engage extremely early in the process of architecting your cloud with the CISO team, particularly with the the risk analysis team to actually make sure that you fully understand their environment before you actually start doing the first, um, you know, the first architecture diagrams and, and circulating them. And then continuously review that as, as you go forward. It's sometimes very difficult to understand what all of these problems are until after you try to implement because things don't surface until you know, some guy that you never met before realizes that um, what you're asking for hasn't gone through the right checks. So you need to be very vigilant in, in that upfront um, engagement with the, with the CISO team. Um, and of course, include all of those requirements in your, in your architecture. Okay, and that's all. I think we just have about two minutes for questions. Anyone? No questions? Tough crowd. The, um, the compliance uh, stage you said about getting sign-offs for each part, did, yes. did you say there was a product that can do that? Uh, it won't actually get the sign-offs, but w what I'm mentioning there is you, you need to capture all of the actions, um, and some of those, you may have some external approval process, but you need to electronically capture all of that into a trail, uh, basically an electronic paper trail that can later be used to you know, verify that everything was done you know, according to process. And the CADIF stuff you had, um, yeah. did you say that that was, I mean, is, is that in-house special source or is that something else? No, the, the, the CADIF, the, the audit middleware is part of OpenStack. So that is a, that is a, a module that you can activate. Uh, you, it needs a little bit of manual configuration OpenStack, but. That's what I was talking about. Do you have that? Uh, yeah, it, it's actually in OpenStack. So or, it's always there. Uh, it just needs enabling. No more? Okay, thank you very much.